sound design. FFTs only provide you with quantitative data, not qualitative. You're seeing an analytical representation of what's happening, but it's not telling you anything about the actual tone or timbre of the sound system you're listening to. Sound design. Sound Design Live is produced independently by me, Nathan Lively, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Welcome to Sound Design Live, the home of the world's best online training and sound system tuning that you can do at your own pace from anywhere in the world. I'm Nathan Lively, and today I'm joined by tour manager, front of house engineer, and system tech for sound image, Chase Benedict. Chase, welcome to Sound Design Live. Hey, Nathan. Thanks for having me. Where are you in the world today? Currently, I live in Nashville, Tennessee. I've been here for about five or six years, and I have to say it's not a bad place. Cool. So you've been off tour for a couple of weeks. Yeah, I've been off uh, for probably about a month or two now. What is the best joke you've heard about your last name? I would have to You're say like, that... None of them are good. My good. name is sacred. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty true, but I would have to say my personal favorite is anytime I get compared to Benedict Cumberbatch. Oh, that's just, that's a good one. Just because he's uh, you know such a, a good looking lady killer. Uh huh. Sure. So every time you come into a, a new space and you uh, uh, meet someone there and like, oh, Chase Benedict, like Benedict Cumberbatch, and you're like, yes. Oh no, maybe that's what you tell people. You're like, how do you spell that's, that? That's that's more what I wish. Um, okay. The reality is, usually I come into a new space and someone says, "Boy, I sure do like your breakfast." <laughs> Gross. All right, Chase. So um, I know that when you are using an audio analyzer, you often don't use peak noise. You've told me that um, you can get just pretty much the same information, uh, great data just by using music as your test source. So uh, I'm curious if you have um, a track that you open every time. Give me some examples of the tracks that are coming out of your uh, uh, test playlist. Yeah, so uh, I, I should clarify that there is on occasion times that I do use pink noise and it, that's more so in a situation when I need to get some really quick data. Mm -hmm. So I might just do like a very quick burst of pink noise. If I'm in like a, a corporate setting where we're far behind on production and the scenic carpenters are still doing a lot of stuff, then maybe a, a burst here, a burst there, and I can collect the data that I need. But as far as reference tracks go, the two that I probably use the most is the uh, Linda Ronstadt Straighten Up and Fly Right. Straighten Up and Fly Right. Straighten Up and Do Right. Straighten Up and Fly Right. Cool down, Papa, don't you blow your top. Yeah. Jazz tune that uh, <laughs> Mauricio is so fond of. <laughs> okay. Um, and then after that, I usually play Bob Schneider's God is My Friend. If I have the time, after that, I'll go through and play Daft Punk doing it right. Doing it right. Everybody will be dancing and we'll feeling it right. Everybody will be dancing and be doing it right. Everybody will be dancing and we're feeling it right. Everybody will be dancing tonight. My thinking is I try to break it up and listen to the PA and individual bands of frequencies. So Straighten Up and Fly Right is giving me an idea of what's going on in the highs and the mid highs. The last tour that I was on, we had a lot of problems with frequencies and from like 1K up to 1.5. And so it was a great way for me to hear in the PA if there was too much coupling in that region. And it was going to cause feedback issues for me during the show. Mm, okay. Uh, God is My Friend has some really great low mid content in it. Now, when you say, then, oh, hold on a second, when you say coupling issues, do you mean sort of like spurious side lobes that are going to go onto the stage and that's what's going to cause your feedback? No, it, with it, especially some of the older PAs like um, Vertec in particular, depending on how the actual angles are set with it, uh, it seems that you get this really piercing like 1.25K, 1.5K just beam that just sounds 
terrible at front of house. And then we've got a singer, a singer who is cupping the mic the whole show, mm-hmm. always standing underneath a main hang of the PA and wants to point his mic at the main <laughs> hang. Those frequencies tend to want to take off pretty bad got it, got when it. It, they've gotten so beamy. So if you play that track and you hear, and it sounds harsh in that area, you, that, that tips you off. Yeah. Well, those horn stabs that are in it are just such a great way to pick out those frequencies. Cool. And I interrupted you talking about the next track, I think. Oh, yeah. So it, um, God is My Friend it has just a lot of good, rich, low mid content to it. And then finally, it, going to Daft Punk, I, get to, I use that to first test the limiters to see if I'm going to come anywhere close to hitting anything. And then as I'm walking around, I'll actually get up on stage and listen to hear how the subs are responding coming back onto the stage. Okay, yeah. Having worked with a lot of artists that like low end on stage and then artists that don't like any low end whatsoever on stage, I think it's pretty important to be cognizant of that fact. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. I think I'm often just assuming that as much as possible, we're trying to clean up the stage, but... Now, as you're talking, I'm realizing, yeah, of course, there's going to be artists who want more energy in some way on stage. Can you talk about that again uh, a little bit for a second? Give me an example of an artist that wants more low frequency on stage. Is that because they have IMs and so like they want something that they can actually feel in their body? What's going on there? Um, I kind of found out by accident at first, you know, the reflections that I was getting from the band is, you know, we think your mix is, is really clean and, and it's very clear, but it, it feels like, at least from our perspective on stage, that it's lacking a lot of, of low end or it doesn't have the low end that we're used to. That was the artist's perception of it from the stage. Yes, it was. Got it. Okay. Got it. okay. And so one of the things that we started talking about is I was explaining to them, because at this point in our tour, it was fairly early on and we had been working with pretty nice PAs. And so I had the conversation with them of, well, you know, a lot of the modern PAs, they are designed to steer low energy away from the stage and into the audience. We had a lot of cardioid subwoofers at this time. And I just kind of started figuring out, you know, hey, these guys really miss that low end that they're used to hearing from back in the days of playing in clubs. So I started disabling cardioid subarrays. Um, even on a couple occasions, had to rearrange some subarrays to get a little bit more low energy back on stage, mm-hmm. and it it made them a lot happier. Wow, cool, um, Chase. I have something that I think you are going to want. Uh, what is it that you have? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, shit! That was really funny for some reason. Have you ever been in a situation where? You need to raise the test signal in the room. In those cases, for example, when you might turn on a burst of pink noise for a little bit to get better resolution in the low end, like your coherence is not good enough and you're basically just trying to overcome the noise floor. Fortunately, I haven't ran into that very often, but I, I, it, funny enough, the last two corporate gigs I did, that was a very real problem that, that we had. So, yes, I would be interested in something like that. (laughs) Okay, so this might not interest you that much then, but for me, it was really special uh, to talk to Mauricio, and he said, oh, yeah, look at this new text signal I'm using. I made a combination of brown noise and pink noise, and I said, why did you do that? And then as he was explaining to me, it became very clear because what I have had to do in the past is when I get to around to really needing to see more resolution in the low end. And, you know, you know that anytime you're in a space where like cars are driving by outside, it can be really hard to get over the noise floor. So what I usually do is if I'm in smart, switch on the pseudo random noise. If I'm in sat live, I turn on the um, there's some uh, low pass noise. Anyway, and then I can crank that up and it doesn't really bother people, but you can, you know, make it a lot louder. So as an alternative to that, what Mauricio has done is uh, mix together pink noise and brown noise. And that gives you uh, a nice balance of just having a little bit more energy in the low end where, where you often need it, right? Is this what he calls red noise? 
So red noise is the same thing as brown noise. Um, I don't okay. know if he calls it. So I don't know if you've been to one of his uh, seminars recently. Then he gave it. He gave you all these files already, so you already have it. Yeah, I, the last seminar I went to it was a couple years ago, and I remember him talking about that concept. But I, it, I don't think he had any files made at the time. I believe he was just telling us how we could make those files ourselves. Yeah. Well, I think it would be pretty easy. Um, I think he just, I don't think he did anything special. I think he just mixed the two sources together. But yes, I would love that file. But uh, yeah, I'll send it to you. And I guess we're just doing kind of an ad here for Mauricio Ramirez's uh, Meyer Sound Seminars. <laughs> Go to a seminar, get some free noise. Chase, how did you get your first job in audio? My first actual job in audio was working in a recording studio, Okay, which they were holding a songwriting seminar, and I had zero interest in, in songwriting, but I paid whatever the fee was to go to it, begged the engineer for an internship, and it, we seemed to hit it off pretty well, so I started interning there and eventually got hired. Then after a while, business wasn't so great, so the studio was in the was the studio ended up closing down. I oh, know. But that engineer introduced me to some folks who ran venues in my hometown. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. And the way I actually got my first live audio gig was I was the only volunteer at this theater who was willing to go clean up somebody else's puke in the first row oh, <laughs> of the of the concert that I was working that night. Wait, you were working as a volunteer doing what? Anything? Um, you know, to be honest, I it was so many different things. It's hard for me to really specify. Okay, so you kind of like, just I, there, I, jack of all trades, and then you distinguish yeah, yourself much. by doing this work that no one else was willing to do, and you got a job. Exactly. Amazing. Chase, so back in September, you and I and 10 other people published a book called Get On Tour. Um, so what I'd love to do is just talk a little bit about some of the stuff you wrote there and see if we can take a, even a deeper dive. Absolutely. So in a section of the book called What I Hate About Touring, you wrote, there are many things that we take for granted in life and touring can shed a unique light upon them. In that sense, the lessons learned can make one especially grateful for what they have. One might find themselves giving up the most basic of life's necessities, like showers or decent toilet paper. There was one tour in particular where, in the course of three months, I spent more days off on a bus in a Walmart parking lot than I spent at home. I can think of another time when the entire crew had to go four days without showering and then hop on a plane. Our only saving grace was the baby wipes we had on the bus. So, Chase, talk a bit about life on tour and, and maybe some of the, these um, surprising, shocking things that you're not, no one's going to really know about until they start in the work. So you're traveling on a bus, which has a bathroom, but no shower, right? So yeah, you know, you're traveling on a bus, there is a bathroom there, but usually there isn't a shower. And if there is a shower, it's more than likely reserved for the principal artist. Mm -hmm. um, just because the, the cost of, of water it, it gets silly once you have uh, a shower involved. Wow. And don't shit on the bus. That's <laughs> rule number one. Because it just, it doesn't go anywhere, right? It just stays there. So even though it's a chemical toilet, I guess, what, you still smell it. Yeah, well, and then there's some toilets, too, that the way they're actually designed, they can't process solids. So uh, it doesn't go anywhere. It's not fun. Well, it, it certainly has a lot of fun moments, but, you know, it can be difficult sometimes, you know, because if you're working a normal nine to five job, then you go home every day and sleep in your own bed, and you don't have to see your coworkers until the next day. And you get to take a shower. But when you're touring, you live with your coworkers, and it, you live with them in a very small, confined space. Yeah, no walls, huh? No, not really. <laughs> um, and the other thing is, you know, oftentimes, yeah, you do get to take days off in really cool cities, but sometimes there's situations where you really might and truly be spending a week in a Walmart parking lot sleeping on your bus. 
And that's because, is that common? Like why, I guess there's not like an RV park for giant buses, huh? No. And Walmart's logistically tend to make some of the most sense because there's food there. They have overnight parking. Um, so it's not necessarily a bad place to be, but it's not a very exciting place to be. <laughs> um, and in our case, the reason why we were parked there is we had about a week off with no shows. The cost to actually fly the whole crew home would have been greater than the cost of paying for an additional week of bus rental. Wow. So we just went back to where the band's hometown was and it had to park the bus there and the whole crew stayed on the bus. Oh, so the band was at home, but you guys weren't. Correct. Got it. So like everything else, budgets you know, can cause pretty radical changes in your expectations. Yeah, and I, I guess the other thing that I think people should know is that um, not all tours are this way. There are some tours that go for, you know, two or three weeks on and then one or two weeks off, and so everyone gets to go home for a little while. There are other tours where uh, I think probably people are maybe flying more often than busing. Um, but then there are other tours, like I think the one you were just on, where you're on the bus with these people for months on end, not going home, right? I don't know if that has to do with how successful you are either, right? Like if you are successful in booking lots of dates and making lots of money, you might be even more busy and just on a bus and not going home, right? Right. It's A lot of it is just kind of how busy the artist wants to be. And, it, you know, in the past couple of years, I've kind of done all of those different types of tours. I've been on the the weekend warrior tours where you're leaving on you know a, a Thursday and coming home on a, a Tuesday or, or whenever. Um, I've had tours that are nothing but fly dates where you know you're just going from airport to airport to airport. It, it does change depending on the size of the artist and where they are in their career. You know you get some of these bands, especially in the rock world, that they've been around for 15, 20 years and they just love touring. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they do when they're gone for, you know, a month or two at a time, if not more. Sounds like a good place for me would be to work with an artist that likes touring, but doesn't love touring, you know? <laughs> yeah, we, someone who just likes touring as a friend. <laughs> Chase, you have made it really clear in the book that an important step to get into touring is to work with a sound company that has touring accounts. Um, but we've also all heard stories about people getting hired straight out of a concert venue or, you know, a laundromat. So is that still a thing? Why did you choose the sound company route? Personally, I had been working as a freelancer for probably four or five years before going to work for Sound Image. And the main thing for me is I was just sick and tired of working with dodgy gear. Okay. okay. Um, I wanted to go work for a place where I knew that there is a, a quality standard and it, that I was going to be working with that same standard every time. I see. Now, as far as the whole notion of people getting hired out of venues, I personally think that that is happening less and less. Sure. Um, I mean, we, you're right. We do know a lot of people that have gotten jobs that way, but it doesn't seem like it's really the case for the newer generations of audio professionals. I personally know one person who's been hired that way, and he actually was hired on one of my previous tours. But generally, you just don't see that happening very often. Now, do you think that's partly due to technology? So someone who is working for a sound company, has their hands on the touring uh, technology all the time. And, and, you know, they've had time to work with it and learn it. And someone who is at a venue might not have their hands on that same technology. Does that have anything to do with it? I think that's definitely a, a real fact. I don't know if that's a primary reason. Working for a company, you do have all of these things at your disposal to learn. And you're going to be working with some of the greatest minds out there in the industry at the time. Got it. So working in a venue, you acquire skills to let you be a really incredible engineer, 
but you're working in the same space every day doing the same thing. As, and it, because of that, you don't generally acquire the skills of having a constantly changing environment that you're always having to adapt your workflow to. Uh, okay. So uh, when you're on tour, uh, efficiency is one of the most important things. And uh, you can be a really incredible engineer, but if you're not efficient with getting things set up and it's taking forever, then it's going to be very hard to be successful at your job. You've been on tour so many days uh, this last year. I'm sure all the time you're trying to be more efficient. Are there a couple of things that you could share with us um, that you just found like, hey, I can't do this anymore because it's not efficient? Or you know what, if I set this thing up first every time, that saves me 10 minutes. I would say the most important thing is making sure that you've done your homework before you get to the space, know what you're walking into. Uh, making sure that you've done all the appropriate prep work on your tour before it's actually started. See, I would say it's important to have the same process every day, if for no other reason, just to establish that muscle memory of what you're doing. Yeah, that's a good point, because um, almost every show that I work on, I write up basically a checklist of the things I need to do the next day, and those include uh, setup, those include you know my optimization process so that I basically don't have to think once I get into the room. I just do the next thing on the list. But if you were kind of working with the same system every day or the same band, you could probably just have one way of doing that and then just execute, you know, and not have to think about the list every time. Right, exactly. But, you know, building a list still can be pretty important. And as production manager, I've made a few people on my crews do that before, and it always sounds really silly at first, but every time afterwards, the, the response has always been like, wow, I, I didn't realize that that was going to help as much as it did. Uh, that's interesting. I, I don't know if, if this will be interesting to other people, but I really like lists and plans and, and documentation. And when you're on a, uh, a show like a Cirque du Soleil, for example, when you're thinking about sort of the upper levels of complexity of shows and you're um, building the space that the show is going to be in, and as like the tent is coming up, you're also putting up whatever your truss and your speakers and, and, uh, and aiming things. So there's, you know, a million things, there's a, there's a thousand things to do and they all kind of have to happen at specific times. So when those guys have a show Bible, it's a really serious thing, you know? So like minute by minute, you've kind of got like, this is the next action. This is the next thing that gets set up. That could help on any show, you know? It's not because it's so dangerous or so complex. Like all of the shows that we work on now are fairly complex. So I guess I don't really have a question. I'm just realizing that, um, uh, you know, a show Bible or, uh, you know, a documentation of process is probably needed on every show. Yeah, and it, I mean, there's a lot of inefficiency that comes from just departments getting in other departments' ways. You know, it's there's a lot of time that could be saved by there being one solid plan, it seems. It'd be tough to actually implement something like that, it, it seems, at least. I see so much time wasted on shows because... Think certain things didn't show up and then there's got to be another run to the warehouse and that takes a few hours or half a day or something. And so then people are kind of sitting around not knowing exactly what else they can do. Like they're sort of waiting on this thing and it's, you know, that could have been solved by a signal flow diagram and someone looking at that and saying, okay, this piece to this piece to the, oh, okay, we don't have this piece. We need to order it. Or this didn't get on the truck or something like that. Every production that I do, I've always got a huge binder full of, Stage plots, input list, writers, block diagrams of how everything goes together. And then it, every individual piece of the actual physical equipment is labeled, color coded. And then oftentimes inside of racks, I've also got patch list just so, you know, everything is as dummy proof as possible. Because, sure, sure. <laughs> you know, the thing is, you know, you might be coming off of a fly date. Um, from a festival going back to your normal tour rig and you've only had maybe two or three hours of sleep and still have to get everything set up and ready to go there's lots of opportunities for errors so you want to minimize questions that you might have or about how anything's going to go together sure let's let's try to remove as much potential for human error yeah exactly 
And did you have to develop a lot of this stuff on your own or were these uh, things that you learned from Sound Image where they said, hey, here's how we do it. Do it this way. In my time at Sound Image, I've been very fortunate to get to work with some really great mentors and have learned a lot from them regarding that type of process. And then I've kind of altered things in my own way to where it makes a little bit more sense to me. Chase, let's talk a little bit about target curves and I guess the danger of relying on them 100%. You kind of tipped me off to this. I've been talking to more people and reading more about it over the last couple of months. So in the book, Get On Tour, you write, one major problem for me was thinking that an FFT could provide qualitative data. For the longest time, I had several target curves I would try to achieve when calibrating the PA. While I've heard of this technique working well for tours that carry their own system, it doesn't really hold up when dealing with different makes and models of boxes. Different PAs have different sonic characteristics. For example, let's say that the first leg of the tour was spent with a Meyer Leo system and the second half was spent with a combination of L Acoustics and VTX. All three are great systems, and while the magnitude traces in Smart might look the same, they most likely will sound very different. I dug myself into so many holes because of this. It especially becomes a problem with some of the lesser quality rigs out there. Over time, I started paying more attention to the differences in transfer function measurements and began storing individual traces for each make and model of PA. Vertec has a specific magnitude trace, as does Leo, K1, and even some of the smaller trap boxes. Then the next time I encountered one of these boxes, I would listen and EQ, observing how similar the EQ decisions I made resembled my target traces. It's usually pretty close. This strategy has been working well for me. So Chase, first of all, what's a target curve? Oh man, just <laughs> listening to all that, that's so many words. Oh my gosh. Um, so to answer your question of what a target curve is, if you're looking in Smart or Sat Live or whatever your FFT software is, and you're looking in your magnitude trace, a target curve would be a, a, a curve that you use as a reference for what you want your PA to, to look like in the software. It's what you want it to look like, not necessarily what you want it to, to sound like. What's wrong with using a target curve? If I take a measurement with one system in one room and then take another measurement with another system in another room and make them match, won't they sound exactly the same? No. they, they what, I mean, they what? might sound the what? same, but odds are probably not. Okay. Why is that? As I said in the book, FFTs only provide you with quantitative data, not qualitative. So you're seeing an analytical representation of what's happening, but it's not telling you anything about the actual tone or timbre of the sound system you're listening to. Okay, so I'm seeing a quantity of amplitude and uh, time data, but that doesn't say anything about if it sounds good. Correct. This is a, a, a subject that I've been particularly interested in, and I've talked to people who are a lot more knowledgeable than myself and asked, you know, why is it that, you know, th this type of philosophy of trying to use the same magnitude target trace universally across all make and model of boxes doesn't work? And it, it's, I've been surprised. I haven't really gotten a great answer. <laughs> um, you know, the in a nutshell, what everybody says, and I've even talked to some folks who are acousticians about this, um, and it, it, it's always like, well, you know, every box is going to have a different transient, every box is going to have a different level of harmonic distortion in it, and, it, you know, it's like, I, I understand all those things, but it seems like that there's probably a more scientific answer that could be delivered than that. So I know you have a workaround for this. So if a single target curve solution doesn't work, um, what can I do instead? Well, the simple answer is have multiple target curves. Okay, for different boxes? Correct, okay. yes. So uh, I have uh, probably about 10 different target curves now, each make and model of box that I'd come across on a regular basis. And uh, what this started as is I would play my reference music and I would actually listen to the PA before I started focusing 
on what I felt like needed to be cut from the array or what type of EQ choices that I needed to make. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, generally I found it that I was making pretty similar EQ choices with JBL Vertec and then I and then I was making pretty similar EQ choices with every L Acoustics K2 that I came across yeah, and interesting. You know, so you started kind to of see so some on trends. and so forth. Exactly. Okay. And it, so I started saving those target traces. And then the next time I would encounter those boxes, I would very quickly base an EQ off of that target trace for K2 or Vertec or whatever it was, listen to it again, and it bypass my EQ, make some more cuts, just kind of compare what the difference was between me working solely off my target trace and me working solely off my ears, and they were usually pretty similar. Interesting. Chase, will you share those with us? Can I put them on the page with this? podcast and so people can um, open them up if they want and kind of look at what you're talking about? Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely willing cool. to do that. However, I, I would say that I would not recommend using my target curves for your own optimization because these are based off of the way my mix is set up and it might not translate as well over to the next person. Yeah, good disclaimer. Um, and, th- and that's kind of an important thing that I wasn't aware of when I initially got started doing this is you, especially if you're, you know, tuning and calibrating the PA for somebody else who's going to be mixing, you have to uh, optimize that PA for that person's individual mix. And it that can get a little hairy sometimes. The reason this works well for you is that you were the front of you are often the front of house mixer and the system tech. So you're able to Correct. set it up and you know that I can make these specific changes for me on this box. It works well for me and this mix, this production. So this is all very specific to you and a specific production, right? If you're carrying your own console and you're working with the same band every day, the two biggest variables that you have are the room and the PA that's in the room. So it, through the optimization process, you have the ability to at least minimize one of those variables in the PA. I always start off with trying to tune my PA to get it to function the way I need it to, which is generally in a pretty linear and transparent fashion. And then I've structured my mix through my EQ choices, my gain staging decisions to reflect having a pretty transparent PA. Nice. And just so I'm clear, transparent means you're playing your test tracks, you listen to them on your headphones, you take your headphones off, and pretty much it should sound the same in the room. For the most part, you know, my headphones aren't very good, so I <laughs> wouldn't necessarily want my PA to sound like them. <laughs> There is a lot of confusion about where to place the microphone for level setting and time aligning front fills. Uh, I get questions about it all the time. I see people doing it wrong all the time. So I know that this is audio only, but let's see if we could just t- touch on this a little bit, or I don't know, let's, let's see if we can talk about it. Could you talk about how to approach this? How do you find the right mic position? To me, it's always, that's actually been a pretty simple kind of thing once I realized it is I think a a hang up that a lot of people have is they're thinking about time aligning or they're thinking about time alignment in a two dimensional kind of way. Sure. When I think about time alignment of front fills to mains, I think more so that I'm triangulating that alignment point because we live in a three dimensional world. We have to time align them in a three dimensional kind of way. So that means you have to take in to consideration not all, not only the displacement of the two sources over the depth, but you have to take in the displacement of the two sources in width and height as well. So there's a, a couple of different ways I've done it. For me, what I the easiest way, and again, this goes back into doing your homework before you get to the gig, mm-hmm. is determining what the coverage patterns of these boxes are and then placing one reference mic in the 
as Bob would call it, the spatial acoustic crossover point. Mm -hmm. Measure the mains, store a trace. Measure the front fills, store a trace. And Smart actually has a pretty nifty feature for this in the delay locate function. What I will actually do, and this might get a little confusing with us just talking about this, but after I've calibrated my time in Smart and from the mains and I play my front fills, I'll use the delay locate function for it to give me the time offset between those two sources. Mm -hmm. Delta delay. And then I enter that delay into my processor and they line right up. Cool. So I think I spaced out there for a second. How did you find, how did you decide on the microphone position? This is where it comes into doing your homework before the show. Okay. okay. You look at what the coverage patterns are of your two boxes, and then you're placing that microphone position in the area of overlap between the two sources, or is it what Bob calls the, the spatial acoustic crossover. Uh, Chase, tell me about the biggest or maybe most painful mistake you've made on the job and um, how you recovered. Well, in a very literal sense, probably the most painful mistake I ever made on the job was during set change one day, and I was not wearing a a hard hat. Um, I had a stagehand tip a piece of truss to move it out of the way and a lighting fixture specifically a Mac Aura, for anybody who's interested in lighting in the audience. It fell off the top of this truss, fell about six feet, and clocked me right in the face. Oh, no. Oh, my God. Um, That's terrible. The one thing that I had going for me is the the glasses that I actually wear are OSHA rated, so they took most of the blow and kept it from being too bad. But I you know, was bleeding everywhere, and it, it was just a big mess. This is right before my artist is about ready to go on stage. So uh, fortunately, I carry a first aid kit in my front of house work box. So as I'm running back out to my console, I got my first aid kit out. But <laughs> it was so hot. We were in a, a Shawnee, Oklahoma, and it was like 97 degrees, 100% humidity, I, I couldn't get any of the bandages to actually stick uh, to my head, so oh, I was having to it's terrible. hold them on and then literally wrap uh, E-tape around my head to get the bandages to stay in <laughs> Do place. Do you have a photo of this? Do you have a photo of this? Uh, somewhere. Oh, God. So, yeah, I, I mixed, um, mixed front of house that day for this artist with electrical tape wrapped around my head. That's so punk yeah, Until after the show was over, and then I was able to go to a first aid tent and was saying, hey, I, I think I might need some first aid. <laughs> yeah, for your concussion. Jesus, dude, that's Jesus, scary. Dude, that's you scary. are, uh, so I guess, wow, everyone put a first aid kit in their um, work bags, huh? Well, what's actually probably a little scarier is when I went to the first aid tent, told them that I needed some help, their response to me was like, what do you want us to do? What? <laughs> <laughs> what? Why? And, and I was like, Why? I was like, I, I don't know. Maybe put a real bandage <laughs> on me that's not held together with electrical tape. I don't ever see people wearing hard hats unless there's people working at heights. Yeah, I mean, my general rule is if there's anything above my head that is moving, I try to wear a hard hat. Okay. But the other thing too is, you know, all of those fixtures on top of that truss should have been secured to it, and, and that. It hadn't happened. Oh, wow. Did anyone get fired? Um, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chase. So I was going to ask you what's in your work bag, but I already know that you've got a first aid kit, some PBE gear. Um, but could you pick a few more things to share with us that are interesting or unique? It's kind of evolved quite a bit to where now I have my actual work box and then I have a duffel bag that I also carry. And in the duffel bag, I have my hard hat, safety harness, and high-vis vest, all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, In the actual work box, I have my smart interface, a series of different turnarounds, cables and connectors, spare pair of glasses. I try to keep the, the general kind of life essentials that I feel like I need. But if I'm in the middle of Dubuque, Iowa, 50 miles away from civilization, that I 
would have difficulty finding, oh, if that sure. makes sense. Now I'm just realizing the light fell on you. Your glasses got smashed. If you didn't have any other glasses, you wouldn't have been able to work. Nobody really thinks about the the basic, you know, kind of essentials of it, of life that you end up giving up when you go on the road until you actually end up in that place. Sure. Sure. You know, it, um, I carry a lot of cold medicine with me, which... Fortunately, I don't have to use very often, but it all comes out of one particular show that I did where, you know, we were in the middle of some field somewhere and the nearest pharmacy was literally 50 miles away. Jesus. And yeah, it's just the common cold. You know, you think it's not that bad, but, you know, most of us live a charmed enough life that if we're sick, we just, you know, go down to walgreens or wherever and you know go get some medicine and then come back home and you know go to bed but if you've got to go work a festival for you know 14 hours and you're sick you know it'd be nice to be able to have at least a little bit of cold medicine yeah and it's really hard to predict all those things because there are potentially hundreds of them you know like oh yeah i occasionally need some ibuprofen i better bring that i've got um you know a small little mobile pharmacy in my work box (laughs) i've got um wet wipes in there you know as i've mentioned before there's sometimes you might have to go without showers mm-hmm. a couple different cable testers i have my generic cable tester that i use i have a multimeter and then i have a, a pretty cool wireless cat 5 tester as well oh cool wait wireless cat 5 tester oh so that you can put one on one end and one on the other yeah exactly Got it. what is your what is it what brand I don't know. It, you know, surprisingly, I actually got it at Lowe's Hardware, so okay. Okay. It, it's not you know too hard to come by. Uh, what is the audio interface you have? A little. I'm a little embarrassed to admit to this, but I actually use the Behringer uh, Euphoria mixer. Dude, that's that's not embarrassing. I know a lot of people who have that, um, and I use one now. And the reason I use one is that I used to have you know a seven hundred and fifty dollar RME Babyface. And then I just plugged it into the wrong place one day and it exploded and I immediately lost $750. And I was like, well, I'm not doing that again. So now I have a, you know, a hundred dollar audio interface that if I blow it up again, it won't be so terrible. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a hundred bucks for, you know, a a four channel interface. If the TSA steals it out of my work box or, you know, it gets knocked off of, you know, my front of house console and breaks like, yeah, okay, I'll go buy another one. Yeah. Perfect. Chase, I know you have made it a point to try to get to a local brewery in most of the cities that you've been to. Tell me about a couple of your favorite ones so far. Oh, man. That's, <laughs> oh, don't that's get a me tough, started. tough don't one to answer. Started. Don't you have a spreadsheet? Can't you open it up and just access all your notes? Um, I'm actually in the process of working on something like that with quite a few of my other touring buddies. Um, our, our goal is in the next year to be able to have an actual... Google Doc or a Google Sheet of various breweries and places to go and in different cities. You know that there's a thing Um, called Yelp, right? right? Yeah, but you know, (laughs) you you kind of figure out like the the people in your your social groups all like to go to the same places, right? Right, and it you know it just cuts through a lot of the noise this way. Mm -hmm. Will serve sound engineers, right? Exactly. Man, that's such a tough question to answer. I I can say that my all-time favorite brewery is in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Oh, wow. It's called Foothills Brewery. Okay. Okay. Um every time I happen to be going through there, I always try to get quite a few cases of beer to take home with me. Um Man, there's good things another- about Winston-Salem. When I was there, I had a really great um ice cream sundae. And I had a root, some really great coffee. So um, it's a good place for food. Yeah. And in fact, that uh, that brewery, they actually used to serve ostrich burgers there. Whoa. So if Foothills Brewery is my favorite brewery, I would say one of my favorite beers is Spotted Cow, which you can only get in Wisconsin. What kind of beer is it? It's um, the best lager you've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> nice. nice. All right. It's, all it's not a, it's probably the simplest beer you could ever have, but it's the best simple beer you could ever have. So what's one book that has been really helpful to you? The most helpful book to me has been Bob McCarthy's Sound Systems Design and Optimization. Cool. 
um, that was the the book that got me interested in in phase alignment and system engineering. It was a pretty pivotal point in my career. Nice. I remember when I discovered his book and I realized, oh, it's not all magic. There are things we can actually rely on. There are things we can measure. There are things we can predict and have consistency with. Yeah, exactly. When you start realizing that this is all actually a science and not voodoo, it's a a pretty significant change. Chase, what about podcasts? Do you listen to any podcasts? Is that what you do on the road? Uh, Oh, so many podcasts. So many Um, podcasts. Yeah, it's funny. Everybody gives me a hard time because I don't really listen to music anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, Every now and then I do, but for the most part, I listen to podcasts and audiobooks, and I, I still try to read quite a bit as well. Cool. So tell but, me, tell me tell what podcast are you listening to? Well, of course, Sound Design Live. Yeah. One of my other favorite podcasts, though, recently just ended. That was YOY, and I was pretty sad about that. What is it? It's um, so one of the the nerdier things that I'm into is data analytics. Weird. Yeah, very very weird, but it. Data analytics can actually provide such a a cool window into cultural norms and and things that people do without even realizing it. Oh, like social studies. Yeah. So um, why oh why it kind of takes a lot of data and investigates how that impacts on our dating culture. Oh, okay. So it's a, a dating podcast, but not a dating advice podcast, if that makes sense. No, that makes sense. Um, you know, so they do things like put uh, microphones on couples for blind dates and then analyze the, the conversations that they have and what types <laughs> of crazy, awkward things come about. So it's, it's a pretty entertaining one. Awesome. Um, awesome. You know, I'm also a pretty big fan of Where's My 40 Acres. That's something that's uh, it's a hip hop culture podcast that is actually ran by a, a co-worker of mine at sound image so when he's not out on tour with you know kendrick lamar or pharrell he's doing you know this really cool podcast oh cool so what is he like interviewing artists or what does he do on the show there there's some of that the the biggest reflection that i would say about it is it's kind of like just being dropped into you know a really cool discussion group business wars is a good one business wars Uh, what's that so uh, I also really like economics. Okay. You know, before I got into audio, I was uh, a U.S. history major, and it studied a lot of economics as well. So Business Wars investigates some of these major conflicts between different companies. Mm-hmm. So they'll cover uh, things like Xbox versus PlayStation, and you know the, these crazy battles that they're having in the marketplace. Another very nerdy podcast, but is, you know, maybe cool only to me. <laughs> no, I think it sounds good. Um, so you're also listening you're also to audiobooks. Listening to Any recent ones that you really liked that you want to recommend? So I've been listening to the the Brothers Karamazov recently. Oh, okay. Uh, one of my favorite Russian novels. I've also gone through Albert Camus' The Stranger, which I think is a a, a really great, great story. Um, if you like very bleak French existentialism. Sure, who doesn't? Wow, so with your audiobooks, you're kind of into fiction and stories, and with your podcast, you're kind of more uh, into nonfiction. Yeah. Chase, where's the best place for people to follow your work? I have an Instagram page that I post some pictures of PAs and my cat. And your Instagram um, handle would be? It is Wait, Chase. Is that, what you, is that the way you say it, Instagram handle, or do you say username? Oh, geez, I don't know. Right. I am uh, not the most uh, hip of the youths. <laughs> the hip youths. Uh, sorry, what, what, so what is your name on there? So uh, you can find me on Instagram under chase.bndct. So chase.benedict, but no vowels no in the last name. Cool. And uh, then otherwise, the best way to contact me is just uh, via email. Well, Chase, thank you so much for joining me on Sound Design Live. Yeah, thanks for having me. Sound Design Live. I want to thank Deborah Heltzer for the music in today's episode. You can find more of her music over at soundcloud.com slash sweetdaisyfriend. 
Sound Design Live is supported by Learn Stage Lighting, Bob Martin, Michael, Rody Free Radio, Joel Ellis, Luther, Senqui, Nicholas, Nicholas, Cuba, Chris, DC Sound Op, and Dave. You can start supporting Sound Design Live today for as little as $1 over at patreon.com slash sounddesignlive. Fly right.